So, today we will be doing lecture five of entrepreneurship and small business management. Lecture number five of entrepreneurship and small business management or class number 10. And we will be covering the family business. So, here it is, the family business. Okay. There we go. We've covered it. That's how you spell family business. That's it. Um, okay. So, what's, let's begin with just a formal definition of what family business is. Right? So a formal definition is individuals, individuals, or descendants, or descendants, of founders in a business have significant, significant strategic control now this is not the same as ownership you could have ownership in a business and quite significant ownership in a business and not have um, significant strategic control right this is kind of the, the driving factor is whoever founded the business has passed down significant strategic control they could not even have major ownership in the business however they could be a major piece of the business and therefore retain that significant strategic control. So that's what a family business is. Now that we know that, why is it important to learn about family businesses? Well, the reality is family businesses are very, 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 very popular. Um, they comprise a very large amount of the businesses in the United States, and it's the situation most would-be entrepreneurs run into that pushes them into being business owners, right? So what are the, some of the advantages? What are some of the advantages of a family business, right? So it's been shown that owners of family businesses have greater internal drive, right? Now this happens for a number of factors that we'll cover, but what's important is the CEOs, the founders, the managers, anybody from the family that's involved in that business inherently has something at stake. It is their family business. They have ownership, and so incentives are truly aligned in this state, right? The second thing is the flexibility of income or sacrifice of it. Flexibility of income, sacrifice. So income sacrifice is actually pretty significant. And the reason income sacrifice is significant is because every single business comes on hard times. Every single business has to get through difficult periods, and every single business does it by doing one of two things. They either cut the workforce, cut costs, and damage their reputation, or the people at the top, the management, the CEOs, and so on and so forth, make a sacrifice in their income and their compensation so that the business weathers difficulty. And family businesses tend to do the latter. Third, they have a perceived, and perceived is an important word here because it's not necessarily true. However, it is true a large percent of the time. They have perceived high ethical standards, high ethical standards, and reputation. Now, the reason this happens is most family-owned businesses aren't national conglomerates. Most family-owned businesses concentrate on a small geographic area, which means that you interact with your community on a regular basis, which means that you service the people that you are neighbors with, and therefore you have a greater incentive to have high ethical standards because you have more on the line. It isn't just business that you're losing. These could be friends, connections, relatives, neighbors, anybody that's involved in purchasing or getting, you know, touching your business, so to speak. Um, Furthermore, you have firm-specific knowledge. Firm-specific knowledge. Now, this is very important. 
uh, because as we learn in history, if you do not learn history, you are bound to repeat it. So when conversations at the, div at the dinner table happen about the current business, and that's 20 years before the next generation takes over, they have a 20-year stash of what's been going on in the business, what challenges it faces, what difficulties, who its customers are, what decisions have been made, and for what reasons. And therefore, there's a longer-lasting memory of what's going on. And firm-specific knowledge can be a huge advantage for running a company. It's one of the reasons that so many companies emphasize their history to employees, uh, is so that they, they have firm-specific knowledge. Number five is shared social networks. Shared social networks. So let's say you have a family business giving investment advice. So you give people investment advice and they take that investment advice and they incorporate it in some way into what they do. Um, and so you have kids and your clients have kids. And so your, your kids take over and your clients' kids become their customers. Right, So this often happens with family businesses because you share social networks. So transition is a lot easier. If your father handled a client and you've been with that client to golf games and various presentations and had dinner with them, over time you begin to build a reputation and they come to expect the same from you as they, do, as they did from your parent or whoever was running the business before you. These businesses are also predominantly focused on the long term. And the reason is you want to leave your family the business, not just some cash, but a way to keep generating cash. That's always more valuable, right? Because cash over time is always more valuable than cash up front, right? Because you have the ability to keep generating income, the ability to keep sustaining the growth of your family. Furthermore, they have a focus on preservation of reputation. Preservation of reputation. Reputation is everything in this kind of business. And the reason reputation is everything is because your reputation is so connected to everything else that you're doing in your community, in your life, and so on and so forth. So the business reputation is closely connected to your personal reputation. And that's very, very important. And the reputation of your family. right? And then finally, you have a reduced cost of control. Reduced cost of control. So a lot of people go to work and they complain about the red tape in their organization, right? This has to get approved by a manager, that has to get go through this channel, this has to be aired on CBS News before it gets implemented, all of this stuff, right? And so the cost of control becomes very high because it slows down an organization. However, in a family business, the cost of control is quite low. Usually the decision makers are within the family. Discussions can happen almost at all times, from family vacations to anything else. And so business is always on your mind. And you're always working with it on a constant basis. You're not just leaving at 5 o'clock and leaving it behind. Right? A famous family business that, that recently became, or not recently, but has become very popular is, is the people at Pawn Stars. Right? That's a family business that's been passed down now to a third generation. Right? And a third generation is quite a significant accomplishment for a family business. But the reason is involvement in the long term. Okay, so we'll talk about some disadvantages. And these are not, the text lists them as disadvantages, right? But I believe that looking, look, after looking them over, they're more trade-offs, right? I think that's a much more reasonable way to look at it. Oh, my mail has arrived. We just got a letter. We just got a letter. Oh, okay, thank you. All right, so disadvantages and trade-offs. So there's a difference. There can be differences. There can be differences in competence and merit. What this means is that not every single one of your family members is going to be successful at being the CEO of your family company. Not every single one of them will be a marketing genius. Not every single one of them will be a sales guru. And so it's often tempting to put someone in your family at the head of the company, even if they're not fit to do the role. 
And that sometimes happens, and that is the demise of many a family business. So it's important to keep in mind that just because they're your relatives, it doesn't mean that they're all competent and have merit. And those of you that have relatives that you don't like will quickly understand that as a matter of fact, it's more than likely that they're not. There's also the push and pull of innovation versus tradition. Now, this is true at any company, to a degree. However, innovation is a driving force. Innovation is a positive force. Tradition can be a positive force as long as it's not too strong. So this is both positive and negative, right? So... The way tradition can be structured is we traditionally care about our clients and put them first. That's a great tradition. That's one. If you were to innovate on that, what would you think of? You would think of we would put our clients second. That doesn't seem like a very good innovation. So that kind of tradition is good. We only use fax machines is a terrible tradition, right? And requires that you switch to email rather quickly. And so a lot of the times what happens here and the tension that happens here is a younger family member will join the family business and be bursting with ideas for how things work. And the existing founder or older family member would like to stick to tradition because things aren't broken, why fix them? And the problem is if you don't fix the things that aren't broken and start breaking some things on your own and trying to innovate, someone else will come along and do so and you will be stuck shit out of luck. So the next thing is unity and cooperation versus, versus diversity and competition. Diversity and competition. Okay. So this is actually quite a complex point. So let's address them one at a time, right? Unity. We all work together. We're all a family. Um, we eat at the same dinner table, but I have to fire my brother because he's stealing money from the bank. Okay, he's stealing money from the company I own. He's whatever he's doing, I have to fire him, right? Um, or I have to do it to my aunt, who I happen to be senior to, right? So unity is only as strong as the company demands it to be, right? So that's where you have to strongly delineate what happens in the company and what happens at work, right? You don't want a situation like Arrested Development where everybody works for the company and everybody's stealing money um, and then the company goes bankrupt and people go to jail, right? So that's unity. Cooperation is something that can happen. I don't actually think that cooperation is the same or in juxtaposition, excuse me, to competition, right? It may be that those words are opposites, but the reality is cooperation within the business and competition with other businesses is very good. The only cooperation that's bad for a business is internal cooperation that allows people to promote from within without merit, right? There, that should be more competition-based. But that's more a basic of business rather than just family business. And finally, diversity can still be embraced. Unless you have a family of 50 people that are going to all be working for your business and running all the different departments, you will end up hiring outside perspectives, right? The problem is you need to have a hiring system that doesn't require every single family member to embrace or like somebody, right? And that's where the diversity problem creeps up the most, is the reality is if you have a family business and you're six people from the same family and you're hiring, hiring a seventh person and one of you doesn't approve, that may actually be a good insight. It may also be thwarting you from attracting better and better talent because the only people all seven of you will approve are people from inside your social circle, right? And that's not necessarily the best person for the job. The fourth and final point is loyalty versus opportunity. And we'll elaborate more on the different types of loyalty and why they exist, but loyalty versus opportunity represents the following. Do I join the family business just because I'm part of the family, or do I take some other opportunity outside the firm that is maybe better for me and maybe in the long run better for my family, right? The other side of it is do we take advantage of an opportunity, although we need to get rid of some of our employees? So for example, let's say that one of your cousins or brothers or sisters is the accountant for the company, 
right? And the company doesn't do any complex accounting, so you know that you can contract it out to a third party and nothing bad would happen. And as a matter of fact, you'd save a huge amount of money on their salary, right? Do you stay loyal? Or do you take advantage of the opportunity? And this is always going to be a debate and, and kind of a difficult thing in the business unless you strictly delineate the business from your family relationships. This can be extremely difficult to do and is often the problem with a lot of businesses, right? However, you always have additional solutions. For example, the person that does accounting for your business and is also your family member could be just as successful doing something else for your business, right? Where you could move them and then contract out the position. So there's different types of family commitments. For those of you in a family business situation, you will know that the following is often true, right? If your family owns a business, you may feel emotionally attached. Emotionally attached. Especially if it's a business that you can participate in from a very early stage. We'll use the example of Arrested Development right? If your family owns a banana stand, if you've been working there since the age of eight, you're going to have some emotional attachment to that business. Now, should you keep working for the banana stand at the age of 45? Probably not, right? But why are you likely to stay in the area and expand in the amusement park, entertainment, whatever industry? Yes, you're very likely, and you're very likely to stay emotionally attached to that business, right? You could also think about obligation, right? So let's say one of your parents owns a jewelry business, right? And that jewelry business is, is rather private. Jewelry as a whole um, tends to be a rather opaque business that's kept within families. And so, that usually because of the quantity of money and the required trust that's, that's needed in that business. But let's say you have an obligation, right? And let's say your obligation is the following. You feel like, well, if I don't do it, no one else will. And so this is the route in my life and I have to take it. Or you're being forced into it by one of your parents or one of your siblings as the best person to do it and so on and so forth. Whether that's positive enforcement or negative enforcement, you're being pushed into that business. So that's an obligation. Finally, there is a cost-based approach and the reality is you can usually afford to pay your family members a little less than you pay just outside people because they care about the business inherently so you don't need to pay for that piece right so let's say you make 50,000 and a competitor would have paid you 75,000 for working for them or you would have to hire outside talent for 75,000 that $25,000 additional piece that this person is making or willing to pay is there to ensure your devotion to the business. It's so that you don't leave the second somebody, somebody offers you 78000 right? So it could be on a cost-based basis that it's simply better for you to go into the business than go out on your own. And finally, there is the need-based business, right? Or the need, the need commitment, right? And the reason the need commitment exists is sometimes, right, your family business will support a litany of people that do not work. Do not work. Now, I don't mean they don't do any work at all. They could be doing charity work or volunteering, uh, taking care of children or any other grouping of things, but they do not bring in income, right? Or at least not significant income. And so there is a need to run the family business to support that, right? That's actually arrested development in a nutshell. So, those are the different family commitment styles and the reasons you may feel committed to join a family business. Now, there's nothing wrong with feeling committed for any of those reasons. There's absolutely nothing wrong with feeling committed for any of those reasons. But, it is important to understand which of those reasons you're comfortable feeling committed with and which ones you're not. And in making your choice and delineating it directly. Because it's important to note that you will do more harm to the business if you join the business for the wrong reasons than if you don't join the business. Because someone else will be found to take your place. And the sooner you make it known that you will not be taking that place, the better off the business will be. All right, so let's talk about enabling success. 
enabling success in, in a family business. Now, enabling success is a pretty good opportunity, right? It's a pretty good opportunity. It's basically what everybody wants, right? Nobody wants to enable failure. Everybody wants to enable success. I think that's, that's a pretty, pretty obvious understatement, but that's, that's how it is, right? So the reality is enabling success, and I'm going to take off family business for a second because I think that it's important to think about enabling success in a larger framework. Right? Because this enabling success idea doesn't only apply to what you're doing in the family business. Right? It also applies to your everyday life, to your work at another company, to your position within a family, and so on and so forth. Right? Enabling success is kind of universal. And so the principles we should look for are universal, and we'll look at a few that are probably business-specific. But almost all of them are universal, right? So the first thing you want to do is promote learning. There is a natural human drive for learning that if encouraged, people develop loyalty because they feel like you're investing in them outside of just financial investment, right? So you promote learning without your, within your organization. You also solicit input. This is vastly important in your day-to-day -day lives and in a family business, right? The reason it's largely important in a family business is because when you solicit input, you allow for outside ideas to trickle in. So it's very easy to get stuck in a bubble way of thinking because everyone around you is involved in this business or depends on it. And so they become either too risk averse or too risk taking depending on their goals, right? So it's important to solicit outside input. Constructive communication. Again, this is foundational for your relationships, this is foundational for your career, this is foundational for just about everything that you do, but in business it's critical, it's critical that you have constructive communication, right? And the reason it's critical is because business decisions are agnostic to your personal problems, right? Business decisions don't care if you and your cousin Larry don't get along, or if he stole your dog, or if you borrowed his lawnmower and then give it back for three months. The business doesn't care. As a matter of fact, if you spend too much time on all that stuff, the business will get in the way. And if you allow that to get in the way of constructive communication, that can be one of the most destructive forces for your business. Right. The fourth is developing a culture of continuous change. Of continuous change. This is a very important concept. Continuous change slash improvement. Right. So the Japanese have this word uh, kaizen for this idea. It's pronounced kaizen. I'm not actually 100% even sure how it's pronounced. But in English translations, I've seen it spelled like this. And there's not actually a word for this in um, in English, but what it means is continuous improvement or continuously getting better day by day, minute by minute, that every day is an opportunity to improve. If you implement this culture, you will be successful because product value is demonstrated or how do I say this? Product cost does not rise with product quality, right? Product quality often brings down costs over time. It may cost more up front, but it will bring up costs and it will bring up and drive business, right? That's something that we saw in the Japanese car industry for a very long time was that product cost was not related to product quality and that product quality actually outperformed the additional costs that it bore, right? So the continuous change piece is extremely important, right? Life is continuous change, right? There is nothing more permanent and more stable and more predictable than the fact that things will change. And if you prepare your organization for the things changing, if you structure your organization, now this is important, this isn't just a personal value that you take in and you say, well, I embrace continuous change and now it works and I'm just doing great now so the business will be just fine. That's not the case at all. As a matter of fact, when you embrace continuous change, you have to build it into the structure of your organization. What that means is that you take your organization and you start putting pieces in that are flexible, pieces that are not rigid. So, for example, if you make uh, a $50,000 payment to your mom every month because, or every year because she needs money for retirement, that's not embracing continuous change. What if there's a business downturn? How will that work? Right? So you need to be able to have 
plans in place, you need to be able to have flexibility in mind and built into your company's culture and your company's processes that things are going to change and that they should change rapidly if you're not doing this you're not exploiting one of the major advantages of being a family-owned firm as a family-owned firm you are more nimble and you are more able to adapt and change and if you're not doing that other behemoths that are unable to change and take their nice slow time and we're seeing fewer and fewer of those right as companies like sears and toys r us have started falling apart we're seeing fewer and fewer even large companies that can afford not to do this. So you as a family business definitely, definitely can't afford to do this. The next thing is merit-based promotion. This is more business-oriented, right? But merit-based promotion is what we discussed before. If people see that you promote your cousin every time there's an opportunity for a promotion, even though he's not the top performer in his group, or however it is that you judge it, people will lose incentive to do their best they will understand that they won't get promoted because they have a different last name because they're not related to you and because they're unable to marry into your family right and so when you conduct merit-based promotions you may hurt some feelings but guess what your objective is enabling success for your business and for your family and in the long run your cousin is much better off if your business is doing well and he still has a job than if you promote him and then everyone loses theirs right so merit-based promotion is an absolute must in a family business next so that was one through five six you want to attract outside talent. Attract outside talent. Now this may seem pretty basic, especially if you have a larger company, you simply don't have a family of 75 people, right? But if you have a smaller company, you want to attract outside talent because outside talent brings with it new ideas, perspectives, and fresh energy. This is extremely important, right? Having new ideas in your in your organization having new ideas in your organization is very powerful, right? Because it allows you to leverage what other people aren't looking at. And as a family business, you are competing with other family businesses. You're not a family business competing with JP Morgan Chase. You're not a family business competing with Kmart. You're a family business competing with family businesses. And so when you bring in new ideas, you give yourself a leg up. When you bring in a new perspective, it allows you to look at the world a little bit differently. And the reason that that's really good is because, once again, you might get caught in that bubble where everyone around the dinner table is talking about the family business. But it's always the same opinions. They're always influenced by things you can understand. And they're restricted in their scope. And finally, fresh energy. And fresh energy is something that family businesses tend to overlook and the reason it's very positive is because as a family business you tend to slow down and the reason you slow down is because you own the business no one can really fire you you have a a, a comfortable space and you're not really in a rush to get anywhere you feel like things are already smoothed out i mean it's existed for 50 years why would it fall apart tomorrow the truth is it can fall apart tomorrow and if you allow these things to start slipping by it will fall apart sooner rather than later seven is fair compensation this is similar to promotions however again if you're paying your cousins or your brothers or your sisters significantly more than what you're paying outside market people one you're making a terrible business decision because you're just throwing money into the wind money that should be reinvested back into your business right and the second thing you're going to be unable to attract and even if you are able to attract you're going to be unable to retain talent right and that's extremely painful for a business next you want to have a plan for leadership succession and we'll talk about leadership succession but for most family firms they prefer to keep leadership within the family that's why they're called family firms and therefore this planning should actually start rather early one people die on timely deaths all the time right that's just natural it's a part of life sometimes people just die 
way before they expected to, or a little before they expected to. As a matter of fact, I think it's a much rarer case that someone dies on time or when they expect it to, right? So leadership succession is extremely important, right? If you have leadership succession, your company will be able to transition into the next stage of leadership. You will have time to train, to mentor, and to prepare the rest of your family, right? Don't leave it in your will. Right? That's not a good idea. Don't just put it in your will. Well, Mark is going to take over for me when I die. That is a terrible idea. Right? And the reason that's a terrible idea is because everyone's going to contest the will. Everyone's going to try to fight over it and try to figure out what's going on. Right? And over time, you'll end up in a difficult situation because, well, what do you do? Right? What do you do in that situation? So train, mentor, and prepare your future leadership. Right? And we'll go into much more detail about exactly how this is done and why it's extremely important. But the only thing you should know is the last thing that you want is you want people fighting over power. You don't want people fighting over leadership. You want it to be straight and clear. And yes, you're going to hurt some feelings. And that's the trade-off of being in a family business. That's what you pay for the control is that you have to hurt feelings of the people that you get to see at the dinner table. And that's all right. That's all right, because they need to also understand that the business, the family business comes first, because without the family business, there's nothing to fight over, right? And if the family business falls apart, then everyone suffers collectively. Number nine is exploit advantages. This goes back to the same thing that I said earlier with becoming complacent. You need to be exploiting advantages. If in order to exploit advantages, you have to reach outside your family, do it. If in order to exploit advantages, you need to take an unpopular decision, do it. If in order to exploit advantages, you have to argue at the dinner table, do it. The reality is, if you're not exploiting advantages and someone else's, eventually you will lose. It might not happen tomorrow, it might not happen the day after that, but eventually you will lose. And as we have discussed so many times already, your business failing is much much worse, much, much worse than hurting some feelings, right? You have to crack eggs to make an omelet, but if you make an omelet, everybody eats. If you keep all the eggs intact, people are just going to eat eggs, okay? And nobody likes just eating raw eggs. Well, I'm sure there are people out there that like eating raw eggs, and to you people, enjoy them. Just enjoy the eggs. Um, so, finally, we'll look at the process of succession. Process of succession. The process of succession is pretty important, and it basically starts very, very early, right? So there's the pre-business stage. Pre-business stage. Right? Whether that means giving your kids private school educations, or hiring tutors for them, or openly discussing business matters at the dinner table. The reality is, even before your child or your nephew or whoever you're grooming to start to take on succession of the business, even before they're able to participate actively in the business, you can invest in them and you should. You should. You should consider it a company investment to do so, right? If you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, great. Take a couple of kids that you have, take some relatives, take whatever, push them into further education, allow them to take advantage of greater opportunities so that you have a bigger pool of people to choose from, right? And that takes us to educational and personal development. Educational and personal development, right? This is an opportunity to do a lot of things, but most of the time, the form that this takes is, one, a college education, right? A college education, usually at a prestigious university or a local university, depending on your business, so that you can acquire a network of contacts. And then the second thing is personal development. And personal development happens directly through experience. Whether that's enabling them to experience other jobs, enabling them to experience other industries, other career tracks, meeting with people, seeing how life can be and how difficult it is or how easy it is or whatever it is that you believe is personal development in order to prepare them for the process of succession is what you need to do and enable there. The third thing is the proof of competence. Proof of competence. This should be a personal proof, right? You don't need to have them take an exam. They're not going to write a written lecture. You need to be simply observing the person that you are grooming for succession or the people that you are grooming for the succession. Over time, you will figure out whether or not they have 
a proof of competence, right? Whether that's through their other jobs, whether they go and work for a close friend of yours or a client that's been around for 30 years and they go and have a job and you sit down with that client over a drink and you say, well, how is he doing? Is he working hard? Is he ambitious? Is he trying? Is she uh, pushing for more responsibility? Is she asking for raises? Is she aggressive in her management style? Is she, does she retreat into herself, right? What are the components of competence that you are looking for, right? And this is going to be different for every business. So if your business is selling insurance, you are going to need someone that is competent at sales. If your business is accounting, you are going to need someone that is competent at accounting, right? If your business is finance, you're going to need someone that is competent at Excel and all the other software that comes around. And if your business is programming or software development, you're going to need someone competent at that. And you can always find someone that's going to be doing that within your family, always, right? And the reason is if you start investing early, right? If you start investing early, you don't have to push them down a specific track. As a matter of fact, that's not recommended. But what you can do is you can enable them to explore different facets and try to understand how they would fit into your family business, right? The fourth piece is a formal start. Now, if you're grooming someone for succession, of the CEO position and you start them as the vice president, which is just one or two levels below the CEO, you're probably not doing them any favors. And you're probably not doing them any favors for a couple of reasons. The first reason is they're not going to be good at the thing that you're actually doing, the thing that your workers are responsible for executing, right? And the reason they're not going to be good is because they've never done it, right? So a more traditional way is perhaps a fast track to the top, right? And the way that works is you start them at the very bottom as soon as you can right? And then you promote them within some time, right? Now at this point, at the formal start point, you have made it all but 100% clear to your employees, to the rest of the family, that they will be a piece of your succession if everything goes well, right? You may even make it clear to them, right? You may even make it clear to them so that they know what they are working for, so that they are learning from the perspective of a future CEO, but still executing on the work that needs to be done. This is quite a workload and not everyone will make it. But you continue to push them up the rungs of the ladder within your company. You continue to take feedback from them. You start to treat them as the CEO. And what that means is if you have someone that you are grooming to be the CEO or to be the head of sales or to even run just a sales division or an individual sales desk, right, just handling some clients, you need to treat them in a way where you take their feedback as though they are already doing that job because they need to be able to see not only what each rung of the ladder is doing, but they need to see the impact of their decisions across the organization. So if they're at rung number one and they say that we need better quality copy paper and you go out and you invest in better quality copy paper, right? You may advise them that, well, we've tried this or whatever, but you try it and you do it again. And they see that that makes no discernible change in sales. You will have proven not only your point and get to say, I told you so, but you also, you also allow them to take feedback in and know how to test their ideas. So if they believe that this is a good idea or if another employee brings it to them in the future, that's what you are showing them. You are also teaching them culture. You are also teaching them culture. This is the culture of your organization. If you never listen to your employees and that is the culture of your organization and that's the way you choose to run it, that's fine. Then teach them the same thing. Right? They may choose to run it differently. So try to understand their unique perspective on the culture, but try to also stress why the culture that you've arrived at is the best one. And so the best way to learn all this is through experimenting, through pushing them through the ranks, through allowing them to make changes. Right, And in the meantime, in that whole process, in the run-up of 10 years, 15 years, 5 years, 6 months, however long this process takes for you, you are strengthening your organization and you are helping to transition it. You are molding it not only in your image, but it is becoming a hybrid, right? And that hybrid, right, that hybrid is actually changing very quickly. So the reason is, if this is your organization, right, and you're training someone, and let's say these are the different facets of your organization. We can consider them culture, decisions, the type of copy or paper you make, whatever it is, your operations, the way you track sales, the software that you use, right? Over time, 
they will, the person that you're grooming, will either change some things or accept them. Change some things or accept them. And that's very positive because the transition is happening naturally. The things that are changing need to be changing because of the values that we embraced earlier. The things that are staying the same are things that should fundamentally stay the same. So you are acting as mentor, trainer, boss, and that's it. You're not a parent. You are not a parent in this situation. I know that's difficult for a lot of people to give up. I know that's difficult for a lot of people to say, but there's no I told you so, you have to do it because you're my son. There's no I told you so, you have to do it because this is the way the business has always been. That doesn't work. That doesn't breed good leaders, right? That doesn't create good leaders. That doesn't give them the confidence to lead a company, right? That gives them the confidence to listen to someone else. And if you're preparing someone to take over a CEO, stop preparing them to fail. Prepare them to succeed in that role of CEO. If you're preparing them to take instruction from a different CEO, that's a totally different story and you should run that differently. But if you are preparing them to run an organization, to run your family business, you need to be a mentor, a trainer, and a boss at the same time and you need to understand all of the facets of what goes into that. So that's our brief lecture on family business. If you guys have any questions, now's a good time to ask them. I'd be happy to answer them. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the lecture today.